Hi everyone. Okay, we are here. This is what we've been building toward. We've been talking about a real number system for many weeks now and without ever really knowing whether any such whether such a thing really exists. Now we're going to see if we can construct a set that will have the properties that we want. Today we're going to prove that there exists an ordered field R which has the least upper bound property. So it's a field, it's ordered, and it has the least upper bound property. Moreover, R contains the rationals as a subfield. So I've said this before, but this is just an amazing thing. This is all there is to it. The least upper bound property is the only difference between the rationals and the reals. And yet, because of, because of the lack of this property, the rationals contain gaps. And by simply adding the least upper bound property to this field, we're going to fill in those gaps so this second statement means that the rationals are a subset of the reals and that the operations of addition and multiplication in the reals, which we're going to define, uh, when applied to members of the rational numbers, coincide with the usual operations of rational numbers that we're used to. So basically, even though the reals are going to be a completely different animal, we can basically identify uh, the rationals inside these reals so that the, the same operations will work. And also, the, the positive rational, it also means that the positive rational numbers are the positive elements of the reals. Okay, so the other thing that's really interesting is that all we know right now is we know rational numbers. We're starting with assuming rational numbers. We're gonna have to construct this field using the rational numbers. So just using sets of rationals, we're going to be able to think of these sets in a way that will give us a least upper bound property. And so the interesting thing, the other interesting thing is that so far, everything we've been doing has been about basic arithmetic, addition, multiplication, division, and then some of the roots a little bit, but, uh, and then what's less than and greater than and so on. And that's pretty much it. In order to do this, we're gonna to have to shift gears dramatically now because in order to do this, it's all about set theory. So these numbers are going to be sets and each set is going to represent a real number. So this is also, it's a good exercise because it will get to see how an example of using uh, set theory as opposed to arithmetic. Uh, so that'll add a tool to our toolbox for, for the future. Okay, so the proof. So the way we're going to do this is, first we're going to define a certain kind of subset, which we're going to call cuts, and they'll have certain properties. So they're going to be subsets of Q that have certain properties. Then we're going to take those subsets, and the next thing we have to do is put an order onto them so that they'll be ordered. Then we're going to show that they have, that these this collection of sets will uh, have the least upper bound property. That's the first requirement. Then we'll, we'll define addition and define multiplication and show that the fields are, that the field properties hold. Then we'll show that it's an ordered field and then we'll be done with that part. And then finally, we'll have to show uh, whether we can embed the rationals into the reals. So step one, Oh, and let me say, this, this proof is uh, basically, I, I, I do it in a different order, but this is basically in Rudin's book as well. It's nine steps. Uh, so that's actually, my steps are a little different than his, but um, it'll take us nine steps to get through this. Uh, so step one is define cuts. And these are the Dedekind cuts that you heard me uh, mention a few times. So the members of R... will be certain 
subsets of Q called cuts. A cut is, by definition, any set that's a subset of Q with the following properties. So first I'll just write them down and then we'll look at them a little bit. So one is alpha is not empty and alpha is not all of the all of the rational numbers. Two, if P is an element, oops, if P is an element of alpha and Q is an element of the rationals and Q is less than P, then Q is an element of alpha. And three, if P is an element of A, of alpha, sorry, then P is less than R for some R in alpha. So what do we have here? It's just amazing how simple this is. And we're going to end up with something that will give us the square root of two, which we didn't have with the rationals. But using just sets of rationals, we're gonna end up with a way of representing the square root of two, just with these rules. And these rules, they, they say so little, but it's going to be enough. It's quite amazing to me. So, okay, number one is that, uh, so these are, these are sets, they're subsets of the rational numbers. So in order to be a cut, the subset alpha is not empty and it's not all of Q. Two, if P is an element inside this subset, and there's another, there's another rational number, and Q is less than P, then Q is also an element of the rationals. And all, what this means is that if you have, you have some set here, alpha, and you find a P here, and you have some other element, Q, Q is always going to be in alpha. So in other words, the, these cuts all go all the way from, you know, basically negative infinity up to some number here. So they're filled down to the, to the left. Everything less than the number is going to be in the cut. Notice that that's very similar to what we started with, with um, looking at a set where P squared is less than two. This is the same thing. It's everything less than this. So now, Interestingly, when we were looking at that, it's kind of motivated now because this is exactly how we're gonna go about constructing the R's. We looked at this, at that set, where P squared is less than two, and now we're gonna see that this is actually what we're gonna to use to make the real numbers. So each set contains all of the numbers less than something here. Even though this doesn't explain, this doesn't tell you what that boundary is, it just tells you that if there's one thing that's in the set, then everything less than that is also gonna be in the set. And then three simply says that, uh, so P, if P is an element of alpha, then P is less than R for some R in alpha. What that means is, this is something else we talked about when we were looking at the, the set of P squared less than two. There's, there's just no largest number. No matter how close you get to whatever this boundary is, there's always going to be one bigger. And what's so fascinating about these definitions again is that it, doesn't say anything about the boundary. It doesn't say anything about where the, the cut ends. It just says that every one of these sets has no largest member, there's always a number bigger, and it contains all of the rationals less than something, although we don't know what that is. The important thing to remember here, we're not describing a set. We're not making a set and then 
explaining some properties of that set and looking at what the properties are of that set. What we're just doing is defining a class of sets, of subsets of the rational numbers. So there are millions, there's infinitely number of these sets, subsets of the rational numbers. Every one, no matter what number you start with, the set is everything less than that number. That's a cut, every one of those is a cut. So what we're looking at is all of the subsets that, fill, that fit these properties. We're not looking at one, and then each one of these cuts uh, we're going to see can be seen as a real number. It will, we'll be able to define those objects as elements of the field R and prove that it's an ordered field with the least upper bound property. So one of the things, so number two, very quickly said that if P is an element of alpha and Q is an element of the rationals and Q is less than P, then Q is an element of alpha. This statement implies two other properties that we're gonna be using a lot, which is A is that if P is an element of alpha and Q is not an element of alpha, then P has to be less than Q. And B is, if Q is not an element of alpha, and Q is less than P, then P is not an element of alpha. So, What's interesting here is that these are just, these are both examples of application of the uh, contrapositive because these all say the same thing. So here we have that if P is an element of alpha and Q is less than P, then we can conclude that Q is an element of alpha. So here we start with the first one, but then we negate the conclusion. We say that Q is not an element of alpha. If the conclusion is wrong, then one of these premises has to be wrong. We're saying that this one's right. That only leaves that Q is less than P. So we can conclude that this has to be wrong, so P is less than Q. For this one, we again say that Q is not an element of alpha. So we're again negating the conclusion. But this time, we're going to accept that Q is less than P. But we know that if this is negated, then the premise has to be wrong. If we're saying that this one's okay, that only leaves that this is wrong, so P is not an element of alpha. Okay, so it's just three ways of saying the same thing logically. But it's very easy to see what all this means because if you have some set here and you have P here that's an element of alpha, if Q is less than P, then it's gonna have to be an alpha because P is. On the other hand, if P is in alpha and Q is not in alpha, if Q's over here, if P is in alpha and Q is not in alpha, then P has to be less than Q. And then the third one is that if Q is not in alpha and Q is even less than P, so P's out here, that means that P also cannot be in alpha. Okay, so we use these formulations. They all say the same thing. We use these two formulations frequently. So something else I'm just going to observe now and then we'll, we'll prove this in step two is that there's something else that this implies, which is that all lesser cuts have to be subsets of bigger cuts. This is what we're gonna prove in step, in step two. But if we have an alpha here and beta is bigger, then alpha has to be a subset. And if there's another one here, gamma, and so on, they're all going to be nested with each one bigger than the other, but they all go all the way down, okay? So the picture, this is the way to understand these cuts. They go, they crawl out this way, they get bigger this way, but they're all going, they're all going all the way to the end on the left. And so each one has to be a subset of, of anything smaller than it. Okay, so this is all we have. What we just did is going to be enough to give us an ordered field with a least upper bound property. And it's such a fascinating thing. We only have the rational numbers. Dedekind figured out how to just use subsets of the rational numbers to create a collection of sets that 
we can put an order on and we'll have the properties that we want for real numbers that we'll be able to use as real numbers. And then the thing is what we just fit, proved last week was if there is an ordered field that has the least upper bound property, then every positive real number will have an nth positive real root. All of that comes from these simple little statements about sets. We're not mentioning numbers even remotely here. It's very interesting. Okay, here is the link to the first video in this chapter. Here is the link to the previous video. Here is the link to the next video. And click here to subscribe and please join me on Patreon. The link to that is below in the description. Thank you.